Hello everybody, my name is Jeremy Agnew and I am the host of the Grim Dark History Podcast where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. If you're just tuning in, this is part two of a multi-part series exploring the life, time of Alexander the Great and his interaction with a lot of different people and cultures. In part one of our series, we built the background of Alexander the Great, talking about Philip of Macedon, his reforms to the army, about his mother, Olympias, and her religion, the Orphic Mysteries, and how important that was to her. We talked about the Greco-Persian Wars, the Greek to Greek Peloponnesian Wars. There was 150 years of Greek internal conflict. And at the end of that conflict, Philip of Macedon uh, swooped in and conquered 98% of Greece with just the Spartans left to their own devices and isolated kind of near the Mani Peninsula. And lastly, in that first episode, we talked about the rumors of Alexander's divinity and the uh, mysteries around whether or not Zeus was really the mother, uh, or pardon me, Zeus was really the father of Alexander the Great and not necessarily Philip of Macedon. We discussed his assassination and how Alexander came to be in control of the invasion army for the conquest of the Persian Empire. Now, in this episode, we're going to be discussing something tangentially related to the rest of the series. One of the things I do here is I try to find something that's a unique experience that all of us who are listening can understand and access in order to help put us into that time and place. Because really, the way the Greek people um, acted and felt and um, thought about the world around them is quite alien to how we think and feel and act with the world around us. Morality is a completely different concept. Right and wrong is a completely different concept to us. And certainly when we're talking about Alexander the Great, there's a lot of atrocities that he committed so it's hard for me personally to find something that I could access in order to understand uh, all the things that Alexander the did and not come away thinking he's just uh, um, you know, a complete um, maniac. So one of the things that I was able to kind of pull out of everything I've read coming up to this podcast was how important religion was to Alexander. So this episode is going to be discussing the religious experience that Alexander the Great uh, would have felt several times, what any Greek citizen would have felt several times, how close the gods and spirits and uh, divine beings were inside the Greek world to the everyday Greek citizen. So all these things are important and it's hard for us to access that. So I took some time thinking about it. And so I've put this specific episode together. It's about what the experience would have been like during an actual Greek sacrifice. And that's gonna come up several times. So that's what this episode is about. Have a listen, I hope you enjoy it. And I'll see you uh, for episode three in our series. And if you haven't listened to it yet, you can go back and listen to episode one, part one. Thank you very much, and let's get to the show now. The One of the goals of this podcast is to make history interesting and accessible to you in a context that you can reach out and touch that you can smell that you can taste so that you can understand 
what the experience would have been like or might have been like for somebody in these far off times and places that we talk about. And as I zeroed in on my topic, my I guess you could call it my theme, my, my topic is Alexander the Great for this next few series of episodes, but my theme is the thing that enables uh, you to access that sensory reality of that ancient time and place in order to put it in a context that you can have some concept of. You know, when we're talking about Alexander the Great and Greeks and Persians and Scythians and uh, Pakistanis and Punjabis and, you know, all these people that we are going to be talking about in this series, it's hard for us to understand them in that time and space because their everyday experience, their lived experience would be so alien to us. And I didn't want my series on Alexander the Great to be talking about, he went here and he conquered this city or he went here and he conquered that city he did this to this people he did that to this this people you know, he we're going to touch on those things because those are uh, important parts but that's not the theme of the episode and you're listening to this podcast partially because you're interested in the topic that we're going to discuss but also in the themes that I pick out and the ways that I describe the history to you. You can listen to another history podcast about Alexander the Great and you're going to get an entirely different take on him. If you've listened to any of the older episodes of Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, uh, you might have uh, listened to the episodes where he did some initial discussions of Philip of Macedon, of Alexander the Great, of Olympia, his mother, and how that lived experience is for those people. If you're a fan of the Empire podcast series, and if you aren't, you should listen to it, Um, but they're starting a series of episodes as I'm recording this on the history of Persia, and Alexander the Great comes into that. The way that they're going to talk about that is going to be, again, a completely different experience than how Dan Carlin presents it. Um, You know, if you listen to one of the older episodes on the History on Fire podcast, they also did some discussions, uh, a few episodes on the Mesopotamians, especially the Assyrians. And Daniele Bellelli's take on that is going to be a completely different experience than Dan Carlin. It's going to be a completely different experience than uh, Anita Allen and William de Rimple's um, Empire podcast. And it's going to be a completely different experience when I'm talking about it. Even though we're all talking about the same topic in one form or another, we're all also all talking about the same time and place in one form or another. And yet you're going to get a completely different experience listening to each of these people, including me. And I'm not a, as I've said many times, I'm not a historian. So I can't compete with actual historians on the proper history of it. I've done a heck of a lot of research and certainly not as much research as historians who spend their entire career studying uh, Alexander the Great or the Persian Empire or, or one little city in those places. But what I can do, what I can tell you, what can be the unique experience that you're going to get from me, hopefully, is the context or the theme that I'm going to be talking about that comes up quite a bit in the story of Alexander the Great, and that's religion. Now, I am not specifically a 
a religious person. I respect other people's um, beliefs and how they worship or not worship. I have, um, you know, been involved in the church in my past, and that's fine. You know, I, my own beliefs about that are, are, you know, aren't relevant here. But an important thing to grasp as we talk about Alexander the Great, and this is what's going to be the topic of our very first episode that's happening right now, and that is the importance of the religious experience. A spiritual experience that everybody in the ancient times lived and part of their daily life. Now, for some of the people that are listening, that may well be part of your daily life too. You may have a daily regimen of worship and it may not just be a lip service. It, you know, it very likely is legitimate religious worship and you experience divine forces in your worship and in your daily life. In which case, if you're that person listening to this podcast episode, you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about before I even get into what I'm talking about. But some of my listeners may not have that spiritual experience. They may not have a a relationship with divine forces. But we can all access that type of feeling And we do it uh, regardless of whether that uh, experience is coming from divine worship or coming from other events in your life. But the ability for you to understand this event is going to be important as we go through our series. And so I want to talk about some different ways of context that maybe you've experienced or someone in your close circle of friends and family has experienced, in which case you have a kind of immediate frame of reference to understand the main theme of the rest of our series. That's the religious experience. Now, uh, as I said, I'm not particularly a religious person, but I, I have I, you know, experienced uh, what I would say is a religious experience. I recall uh, many, many years ago, I was, I was dating uh, a woman whose uh, religious you know, worship was an extremely important part of her life. And there was a touring gospel, gospel group that was um, giving a uh, you know a gospel kind of revival experience at the local church and she asked me to go with her it was late at night she didn't want to walk at night so sure I, I went with her and I remember being at the church and listening to the the gospel singers and they were amazing singers first off you know as you might expect if if you've ever, uh, listen to gospel music. They are fantastic singers. Um, but I remember we were there, and uh, at one point near the end of the whole experience, um, whoever it was in the gospel choir just invited people to come up front and pray with them. And, you know, one or two, you know, this was a packed church, and I remember, you know, a few people get up and, they, you know, they go down to. Uh, the altar where the the gospel choir was, and they all knelt down together and started praying. And I remember as the prayer went on, just more and more people just got up out of the audience and they walked to the front of the church and they just got down on their knees. They were standing close to each other. Everybody's hand was on the shoulder of the person in front of them as they were praying. And I remember just... It was like a domino effect at one point where, you know, there's a certain threshold that uh, got reached in terms of people just voluntarily, you know, immediately kind of going up and and kneeling down to pray uh, that 
you know, motivated the, you know, I wouldn't call them less faithful people, but maybe people that were a little more reserved in their worship. But something flicked a switch and just like a wave that went through the crowd, the entirety of the church got up at some point and they all walked to the front all of them on their knees, you know, a hundred or so people in the church, everybody from child to elderly person was on their knees, praying, Their one of their hands touching the shoulder of the person in front of them, and the person at the very front touching the altar. And I remember, even though I'm not a religious person, I remember being very emotionally moved just witnessing that and I remember the feeling being very indescribable to me and and here I am trying to describe that feeling to you and even though I'm not a religious person I would call that a religious experience the emotion running through the crowd that just jointly moved even the most reserved person to participate, that moved people who were um, elderly, sore, probably a little arthritic, uh, out of shape, to get up out of their chairs and get down on their hands and knees at the front of the church and pray as a group. I remember that being very emotionally moving for me. And again, the only way I can describe that experience is a, a uh, um, you know, inexplainable emotion that somehow grabbed the entire crowd of the church and moved them all into this action. And, uh, you know, if somebody told me from that crowd that they felt the hand of God, I 100% would have believed it. That's the closest I've ever been to experiencing a religious experience like that. The touch of the divine in and amongst a crowd of people. And this is me in, you know, uh, early 2000s experiencing this. Wind back time, 1500, 1700 um, years, 2000 years, 2500 years, 3000 years, where science doesn't really exist, not in the way we would understand it, where um, every illness is the work of divine forces, where if your crop failed, it was divine forces, where if the rains were too much or too little, it was divine forces where if you had a sick goat in your herd that was divine forces whether your child lived or died those were divine forces whether you um, held or broke in battle those were divine forces that type of experience is hard for us to understand and access, but that's what it was. And you can imagine the spiritual experience if you can think of some way of somebody in your life who's had a religious experience and understanding, being able to take that and then transmit that feeling back in time to everything 
how emotionally charged it would be for you if uh, you know a goat was sick there were divine forces at work and you had to cast a spell you had to invoke divine forces you had to access the divine in some way in order to find out what happened you needed some method to communicate with them in order to solve that problem so this is the time of alexander the great and there are other ways you can have a religious experience other than the experience of actual kind of group divine forces you know there are people you know that talk about runners high if you're just a, a long distance runner the type of endorphins that might come out of your body um, you know at the end of a heavy workout section with weights there there's other ways to get your brain working in a way where you're open to other ways of experiencing the reality around you and certainly there are drugs that'll alter your experience of reality but there are ways to do that that don't involve drugs but one of the most powerful ways to do that is through group activity group actions and if you've ever been to uh you know an nfl football game for example you might understand exactly the feeling that i'm talking about even if you're not a religious person at all the energy that exists in the crowd at an nfl football stadium is another one of those unexplainable forces and I would believe it if somebody told me that, you know, you're a rabid fan of um, a football team or a hockey team or, and when I say football, you know, maybe American football, if you're a European listener and I'm happily uh, able to announce that I do have lots of European listeners and Asian listeners and even a few listeners in Africa. Thank you very much for your listening. Obviously, football to you means football and not American football. But you would have that experience too if you've ever been to a football match that was, uh, you know, a significant matchup. Maybe it was for the World Cup event. Uh, maybe it's a rivalry between two teams that you're particularly attached to. But there is an energy that exists in that crowd that's hard to explain and and it's uh, and here I am again attempting to explain it to somebody who's maybe never experienced it but the energy that exists for something that might be a minor activity or event you know this guy stole the ball from so and so or intercepted a pass whatever that was those things if you were on your own, you're just, oh, well, excellent skill, good play, you know, good job. But when you're in a crowd, thousands strong, the small little job well done becomes an emotional cheer that moves through the audience like a wave. And it's hard to explain it any better than that but you will find yourself drawn up into the noise into the energy of the crowd and even if you are a very reserved person you have to work very hard in your own self-control to not get caught up in that energy in one form or another so I would say if you don't understand a religious experience in the way I was describing a little earlier, maybe you've 
experienced that type of energy from a crowd at a major sporting event. And I would put it to you, uh, again, if you're not a religious per person, that that's a type of energy that's inexplainable. It's hard to put into words. There's no adequate way to really explain it other than there is an energy that moves the crowd in a way that wouldn't happen individually. So with that in mind, that type of energy in mind, whether you experience that energy as divine forces or you experience that energy as um, you know group shared experience whether you experience that energy through your own individual activities of generating endorphins through your own bodies through runners high or, or you know things like that if you can grasp that type of feeling, you're going to understand a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. So this episode, as we move into the meat of the episode now, I want to talk about what a Greek religious sacrifice would have looked and felt like. Now, I don't want this to be a overly graphic experience for you. I want you to imagine that feeling I was talking about just a moment ago. And if you can access that feeling or the memory of that feeling... I want you to try and put that feeling in the context of what I'm about to describe to you. Because that is the feeling of what a Greek person would have felt during a religious rite. So we're going to start with talking about what the area even looks like as we get ready to do our sacrifice to the gods. We have uh, amongst ourselves the entire community. And when I say entire community, I do mean the entire community. This was very much a group communal experience in order to properly perform a sacrifice to the gods. This wasn't something you did on your own and then walked away. So the community is a very important part of the Greek religious experience. It's an important part of being able to access the divine forces. So we have our entire community. And when I say community, you know, if we're thinking of ourselves in a village, we have uh, the entire village with us, or as much as possible that can make it. If we're talking about an army, we have the entirety of the army that's able to be there, also present at the sacrifice. If we're um, at the opening games of the Olympics, well, we have the entire population of the city where the, that's hosting the Olympics, uh, plus all the athletes, plus the king, plus the priests. So, uh, you know, wherever we are, if there is a community around us, as much of the community as possible is present. So imagine the experience if you're an everyday soldier in Alexander the Great's army, you have 20,000 plus 
fellow soldiers around you, plus camp followers. Camp followers might be your wife, maybe. Might certainly would be cooks. There'd be slaves, lots of slaves, servants. Not every servant necessarily was a slave. Plus you'd have uh, just regular Greek people that aren't net fully soldiers yet. They'll be there. We'll have the priests there. We'll have, uh, if we're part of Alexander the Great's army, not only are there priests, there are astrologers, there are diviners, there are teachers. And when I say teachers, we're talking about people like Aristotle. Those people are all around us. This is the community that we're at. 20,000 plus people. Easily a stadium's worth of people. So imagine when I was talking just a few minutes ago about the energy that would be in a football stadium that would cheer for a relatively minor event that would become a undeniable force and emotion that move through the crowd uncontrollably that's the levels of energy that exist in this community as we prepare for the coming sacrifice and as we're gathered around we're not inside a temple if we are near a temple the sacrifice will happen outside the temple. Maybe, uh, you know, at the front of the temple steps, there'll be an altar. If we have a large temple, we might have several altars. But for your everyday soldier in Alexander the Great's army, when we talk about sacrifices, we may not always have a temple handy for us. So for us, We've built altars. We've cut wood. We've carved them up. We've done our best. We have artisans with us to make the altars appropriately adorned to be sufficient in order to please the gods. This isn't just a square box. We might even have, uh, very well, would have stone or bronze um, altars with us. They would be heavily adorned, intricately worked with the finest artisans over the years. You can imagine beautiful Greek embossed designs, dedications to the god that we're about to give an offering to, so we have our crowd that's thousands strong. And we don't just have one altar. We have dozens of altars set up across the field for the thousands strong to all be able to see and properly take part in this religious experience that's about to take place. So it's not just... You're some guy in the back who's only five feet tall and you got the guy six foot in front of you blocking your view. You've got a giant field to spread out in, but not too far out. We all want to be part and close enough in order to feel that energy of the crowd. But there are several altars set up across the field so that we can all be as close as possible to the main event. And as we get ready for the main event to happen, there'll be an aisle upon which nobody stands that leads up to the altar. And down the aisle will walk the priests and the priestesses that are going to take part and lead our upcoming sacrifice. Now we have a little bit of an idea of what 
it looked like from a general crowd experience. We should talk about what it smells like right now because there are fires burning all over the place. There will be giant bowls of incense all around us. And when I say incense, if you've ever uh, lit incense and had that kind of smell moving around, even though we're in an open air environment, because we've got the burners everywhere, it'd be very hard to be anywhere in this crowd and not have the smells of incense coming over us. And the incense that we smell will be frankincense and myrrh. And if you've ever wondered about what is even frankincense and myrrh smell like, I'm going to describe that to you. Frankincense smells a bit like pine or balsam wood, if you're familiar with that smell, if you have ever taken a handful of pine needles and tossed it into a fire, or if you've ever opened a bottle of pine saw, that that smell that comes out of you is a bit like frankincense. That's the piney part of frankincense. It's actually a much more complex uh, smell than that, but it's definitely uh, got that wood burning type smoke smell, the little hint of pine and balsam wood, and um, it's even a little citrusy if you can imagine all these flavors coming together. If any of my listeners are uh, somebody who brews their own beer, you'll work with hops. Well, you might be familiar with uh, hops like Citra um, and, and similar ones to that. That's a bit what frankincense would smell like. A little citrusy, a little piney, kind of earth-like. It's a pleasant smell. That's frankincense. Myrrh is kind of similar to frankincense. It's a little bit woody. It's kind of got um, heavier, smokier notes to it. If you've ever um, taken a hunk of resin from a pine tree and burned that, that's a little bit what myrrh smells like. It's got a also distinctly medicinal smell to it. It's a very distinctive and powerful um, smell if you've ever heard it. Yeah, you know, maybe probably the best way to describe it is go to your local pharmacy and buy a bottle of Buxley's Mixture. Buxley's Mixture, their uh, slogan is, it takes awful, but it works. But if you smell Buckley's mixture, that that's a medicinal smell. And that's what I'm talking about with myrrh. Now, myrrh is not as awful smelling as Buckley's mixture is. But there is a distinctly medicinal smell associated with it, along with kind of the smokier wood burning smells that you would get with it. You also kind of get some spicy notes. So if you've ever kind of uh, uh, toasted peppercorns or allspice, that's a kind of spicy smell I'm talking about. So, so myrrh is a very complex smell. It's got that medicinal note to it. It's got a smoky note to it. It's kind of got a peppery note to it. So we have frankincense and myrrh, those smells all around the field of 20,000 plus people. You can imagine the smoke wafting around you and the smell from the crowd, lots of unwashed people, 
the smell from the frankincense and the myrrh, the smell from wood burning fires, because there are lots of wood burning fires also around the field. I'm going to get to why they're there in a moment. So there's lots of smoke, lots of smells wafting around, the energy of the crowd, and we have an empty aisle upon which our religious procession is going to come. There's a uh, pregnant intensity in the weight. And as our religious procession begins coming down the aisle, we have our priests and priestesses coming along, and they will be leading the sacrifices. Remember I said there are multiple altars set up across our field here in Alexander the Great's army. And the animal animals that are being led down the aisle are bulls and oxen. The very healthiest, the very biggest possible. And Alexander the Great, being the king of Macedon and the de facto leader of 98% of the Greek peoples, would have access to the very best possible bulls and oxen. And that's what he will be sacrificing today to kick off our crossing of the Hell's Pont and the beginning of our invasion the Persian Empire. As the bulls are led down to the altar by the priests and the priestesses, they will be adorned with clothing. When I say clothing, they'll be draped in fine cloth. They'll have uh, wreaths or laurels around them. They will be treated as best as any animal could possibly hope to be treated in the lead-up to what's about to happen. Now, even though you're not a member of the priest class, you are not just an observer in this sacrifice. You're a participant. Everybody in the crowd who is not directly a priest or priestess will have grain in their hands. It could be barley, um, you know, whatever it is, you've got a grain of some kind, but barley was very commonly used. And you'll throw the barley into the air towards the aisle as part of the procession. You are participating in the group shared experience. So imagine thousands of people, the smells of frankincense and myrrh and wood smoke wafting around the crowds. And then everybody begins tossing barley towards the aisles as the priests and the priestesses lead the bulls down for the sacrifice. And as the bull is led up to the altar, there will be three priests or priestesses at the head of each altar with each bull. There'll be some prayers given to the God that they're about to make the offering to. There will be uh, wishes and beseechment for divine blessing in the upcoming campaign. And then one of the priests will pour some water or some milk over the head of the cattle. Now, the cattle, the bull, the oxen, will naturally, once the water starts pouring on their head, lower their head. 
This is just an instinct the animal happens to have. But while this is happening, this is the priestess asking for the animal's permission to sacrifice it to the gods. They don't just kill the animal, they ask the animal's permission to participate in this offering. So this is as much an experience uh, that is participatory of the crowd, of the religious castes, and as well as the animal to be sacrificed, are all taking part in this religious experience. And as the animal bows its head and gives its, gives its permission to be sacrificed, there will be somebody standing right next to the cattle who, with the blunt end of an axe or with a club, will very quickly strike the animal on the head in order to stun it. This is to keep the animal from struggling with what's about to happen. And once the bull has bowed its head, given its permission to be sacrificed, it's struck and stunned. And then the third priest or priestess who holding a tray of barley that they had been casting as part of their participation will pull out a curved knife that had been hiding in the barley basket and they will slit the animal's throat. And as the bull who's stunned loses its consciousness as the blood drains out of it, the blood will drain into an offering bowl on the altar. And you can imagine the energy in the crowd when this happens. This is the main event. This is what you've been waiting for hours for. This is the shared experience that everybody was participating in. And now the animal has given its life for your well-being and the entire crowd erupts and whether you wanted to or not you erupt with that crowd this is that emotional compulsion of divine forces that pulse through the crowd through your participation with the barley throwing, through the smoke and incense that you've been inhaling, through the energy and expectation of the upcoming campaign, that you've all crossed one of the most dangerous uh, rivers in the world with an army that's thousands strong successfully. And now it's time to give thanks to the gods. And as the animals blood drains out of it and it passes away the priests will use the knife that they use to slut the animal's throat and they will pull out some of the organs and the entrails as they clean the animal they will inspect the entrails the liver the other organs for signs that the gods have been pleased by the wealth of this sacrifice. And the priest, after spending its, his due expertise examining the organs, announces to the thousand-strong crowd that this has been a worthy sacrifice, that the gods are pleased, and that they have blessed Alexander of Macedon and his army with good fortune in the upcoming campaign. And now that this has been done, 
it's time to give the gods their part of the offering. Not only have we just drained the blood out of the animal, we're actually going to offer the gods part of the animal. And the gods in Greek mythology don't want for a whole lot. You know, you might think, um, you know, priests would want as much as possible for the gods to be happy with the sacrifice. It's almost as if um, once the sacrifice is done, the parts of the animal given to the gods is an afterthought. But the parts of the animal that you don't want happen to be the parts of the animal that the gods want. So it's a nice deal for everybody involved. A nice little bonus. The priests will keep the skins from the animal, from the bulls. The organs that nobody's going to eat, as well as the thigh bones, which are so thick on cattle you can't possibly uh, properly cut them open and get them out, get the marrow out. And the hair and mane from the animals will all be burnt. They'll be put on one of those fires that have been cooking. And the smoke will send those parts up to the gods. And the gods will be happy. And the rest of the animals, and we've sacrificed dozens as part of this thanks. The dozens of bulls we've sacrificed, they all get quartered up put on roasting spits, and put over all the fires that have been burning around us for our religious event that we've been holding. And as the meat cooks, you've been standing there for hours, being a part of this. You've been waiting for the priest to be ready. You've been waiting for the offerings to be taken from the back of the army train to the front. The field had to be appropriately prepared and leveled in order to make sure everything was perfect for this offering. So you've been waiting all day. You've even been participating in making sure the ground was level and making sure the areas are fenced off, that the fires are right, that there's enough wood, that the incense is ready. And now... After the sacrifice is done, after the appropriate offerings have been put on the fire and sent to the gods to feast on, and now you're smelling the roast beef of the oxen and the bulls that are roasting on the fires all around you, and now the wine comes out, and it's time to really give thanks your religious experience that i've been talking about all all that earlier the crowds the emotion the tension all of that is now released and it's time to enjoy the feast of cooked cattle with your fellow soldiers, with your neighbors. You may even see Alexander of Macedon off in the crowd with his companions and generals. But after the cattle's cooked up, you've taken part in the feasting. You've eaten for hours. You've drank for hours. It's time to go to bed and sleep off the few hours that are left in the night because the sun's just about to rise. And when that rises, well, it's time to invade the Persian Empire. Now, as I've been uh, talking about this in the first half of the episode, I was trying to give to you 
some context to the feeling of the divine in the everyday experience. Second half of this episode, I was trying to describe to you what a typical sacrifice may have looked and felt like for Alexander the Great and his army. And what I was hoping to try and get across to you was the feeling of the divine in everyday things. That the divine can be not only in that ritual of the sacrifice, that's how you appease the divine, but the divine was everywhere in the world of Alexander the Great. The divine was in the rivers and waters that needed to be crossed. The divine was able to determine whether or not your army would break in battle. The divine determined whether or not the weather was fair for a particular engagement. The divine determined whether or not you were going to live or die in battle. This was all part of everyday, matter-of-fact, cause-and-effect life. We may understand everyday life, you know, I get in my car in the morning, I turn the car on, I drive to work, and if I get hit in an intersection, well, that's the fault of either some component in the car didn't break, maybe I wasn't paying attention going through the intersection, maybe the other driver wasn't paying attention going through the intersection, Maybe the weather created slippery road conditions. Maybe visibility was poor. These are all maybes that we talk about that are part of rational cause and effect thinking of today. In the time of Valor, Alexander the Great, rational, everyday cause and effect thinking was there was sorcery at work. There was divine forces at work. You know, your chariot didn't get hit going through an intersection because you were an idiot or the road conditions were bad. That happened because there was some divine force at work. At least in the world of Alexander, that's how it's interpreted. And I was trying very much to try and make you understand this and, and maybe I hopefully I was successful because it's going to be very very important as I start getting into the meat of the Alexander the Great story and we're going to be talking about it more as we talk about Alexander the Great's own divinity so tune in next month for our very next episode in this series when we start digging in to the background of Philip of Macedon and how Alexander the Great came to be in control of the Macedonian army. And we'll be touching on Alexander the Great's divinity there, especially in his relationship with other Greeks, in the relationship with Persia, the relationship with his own mother, and his relationship with his generals and companions. This has been an episode of Grim Dark History. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show.